you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and amazed to see you all here. I want to first thank Warwick's, this great independent bookstore, for opening their doors to us this evening. And for creating a community of book lovers here in La Jolla and for giving this debut author a chance to tell her story. So thank you, Warwick's. And thank every each and every one of you for being here. I cannot express what it means to me to see all your faces here tonight after two years of effort on this project. Uh, it's great to see a room full of friends. There are three things on your chairs, hopefully also a little wine in your laps, um, but there are three things on your chairs. The first is a little promo card that's a gift from me to you. The second is um, a review that just appeared in the Wall Street Journal Ooh. on Saturday. I couldn't have timed it any better. And the third is a flyer with some bios of some of the featured racers on the backs. So if you could hold on to that one, we're going to refer back to that uh, in a little while. Um, I'm sure some of you are here because you're, in, you're endurance athletes or cyclists. If I could maybe see a, some hands for, for folks like that. Some of you might be here. Oh, great. Good, good crowd of cyclists. Some of you are here maybe because you're lovers of the outdoors and you're interested in an epic tale of adventure and survival. And I know all of you are here today because you're curious why a nice girl like me would choose to write a book about the most brutal and harrowing race on the planet. So just look at me. I'm a middle-aged woman. I had a career in business. Most of you know that. Some of you might even know that I grew up nerdy and very unathletic in New York City. Not the exact profile of someone who would write a book like this. So tonight you're going to hear all about how someone like, like me got mixed up in this sort of thing, but first I want to explain a little bit about this race called the Race Across America, and then we'll close with a short reading and a Q&A. How does that sound? Okay. All right. So before Hell on Two Wheels, how many of you in this room had heard about the Race Across America? Oh, okay. That's a, that's a decent number because this is a very obscure race. This race is straight out of untold stories of the ER. And this part of my talk is going to be a bit ghoulish, but since there are a number of cyclists in the room today, I think that's actually what you're here for. So <laughs> let's get started. Here's what this, this race is all about. Each year, the world's top ultra-distance cyclists gather just up the coast in Oceanside, California, for what Outside Magazine has described as the toughest test of endurance on the planet. This is a bike race like no other. It's nothing like its more famous cousin, the Tour de France. It's crazier, it's more gothic, and it's even savage. Now here's, here's how the Tour de France differs from the race across America. The Tour de France is what's called a stage race. It takes place over 21 days, and each day is a stage, and the racers begin racing at about noon, and they finish at about 5 p.m. After the stage is over, they go back to their hotel room, they get a massage, they get a gourmet meal, and a night's sleep. The race across America is like a single, non-stop, 3,000 mile long stage. Once the gun goes off in Oceanside, the clock doesn't stop, so if you sleep, you lose. And the first person to race a prescribed route from Oceanside, California, over the deserts, across the Rockies, through the windswept plains, across the Appalachians, finishing up in Annapolis, Maryland, is the victor. It takes racers up to 12 days non-stop to complete this race. 12 days. Think about walking, taking a little neighborhood walk on a Sunday afternoon, starting at noon, you know, and then deciding just to keep going and not show up for work at all that following week and just keep walking around your neighborhood and maybe at three in the morning you pass your house and you wander in for a shower and a few hours of sleep and then you're up and walking again and you don't show up to work all week and it comes next Sunday and you decide to keep going until the following Friday. Okay? Now throw in 100,000 feet of climbing, deserts, swollen hands, swollen feet, pulmonary problems, 100 degree temperature, did I say 100 degree temperature? And you're not even close 
You're not even there to describing what this race is like. This is why the racers who race the race across America can be seen wearing a t-shirt that reads, anyone can see that? Can anyone read that in the front row? This ain't no tour. This ain't no tour. Okay. <laughs> Compared to the compelling visuals of the Tour de France, this is uh, a lot more disturbing. It's practically impossible to convey what it feels like to propel oneself under one's own power 3,000 miles nonstop. Think about it this way. The average jogger, I'm sure a lot of you do, who jogs, say, three miles a day, five days a week, would take four years to cover this distance. <laughs> now, that's a long way. So I, I followed this race for two weeks in 2009. I had gotten to know many of these racers uh, beforehand. I traveled all over the world, got to know them, their family, their life story. Then I followed the race for two weeks. And I had befriended many of these folks. They, gave, they were very generous of their time. They really want to be seen as fully realized human beings. And I was there to tell their story, and so they spent a lot of time with me. So they became friends. And as I followed this race, it was much more disturbing than I ever imagined it would be to watch this race grind down my new friends, brutalize them day by day. They were absolutely brutalized by this race. And here's, I'm going to read a list. Here's why Outside Magazine said what they said about the race across America. Here's a short list of some of the physical maladies that these racers experienced during, during the race. Cyclists lose the use of their hands and fingers during the race because of nerve compression in the wrists. Oh, as the days progress, they can't dress themselves. They can't feed themselves. They can't clean themselves. They experience dehydration and heat stroke in the heat of the desert. Their muscles and joints self-destruct over time. They endure ghastly, ghastly saddle sores. I don't even want to go there, girls and boys. <laughs> girls and boys have different problems, but they all have problems down there. They experience edema in their extremities. Their hands and feet swell up. They suffer every type of digestive problem known to man because they're consuming three to four times the number of calories as the average person will <coughs> for a long period of time. Broken bones, abrasions, and worse, caused by crashes. Pneumonia and life-threatening pulmonary problems due to the extreme temperature changes from the desert up to the Rockies. They experience a, actually a horrifying phenomenon not seen anywhere else, as far as I can tell, which is the sudden failure of the muscles in the neck. The human head weighs 8 to 10 pounds, and hunched over a bicycle seat for days on end, racers, not all of them, a small minority, can experience a phenomenon where their neck muscles suddenly fail and their chin gets pinned to their chest like a newborn baby. It comes on like that. When this happens to a racer, he almost always drops out of the race. Some of them actually try to brace their necks on pedestals or using scaffold <laughs> devices to try to race on. But it is a pitiful and horrifying sight. And when it happened to one of the, I won't give the story away, one of my new friends, I had to avert my eyes. I could not watch this poor man suffer in that condition. The biggest challenge that the race across America presents is to the mind and the spirit. The most vexing of which is sleep deprivation. Racers need to minimize the time they spend off their bikes in order to meet stringent time cutoffs that take place across, across the continent. They do everything while they're on their bikes. They brush their teeth, they eat, they change their clothes, they talk to friends and family, they plan race tactics, everything is done um, on the bike. And yes, you can ask me about those things, which I know you're thinking about in the Q&A session. <laughs> Um, and maybe or sometime in the middle of the night they'll tromp into their motor home and they'll get a shower and a, and a, and a quick rest. They're all um, supported by crews of 6 to 12 people who are on duty 24-7 taking care of their safety and creature comforts. Believe it or not, the winners 
get about an hour of sleep out of every 24 hour cycle. That's one REM cycle. Their crews will actually watch them sleep and when they see the unmistakable signs of their eyes fluttering, which is the sign that you're going through a REM cycle, they get woken up and put back on their bicycles. Amnesty International would consider this torture. level of sleep deprivation to be torture. The cyclists' minds are shattered by day three. They become simpler beings. Okay, ready for some symptoms of sleep deprivation? Many of which, not all of which, but some of which I actually experienced following this race. This was a diabolically difficult race to follow, which is why no one's ever written the book. I don't know, I, maybe I didn't get the memo. But, so here's a list of, um, of the cumulative effects of sleep deprivation. Delayed reactions that can lead to violent crashes. Behavioral problems, including depression, confusion, and anger. Racers blow up at their crews. They become people they, don't, they aren't proud of becoming. Um, paranoia and suggestibility. Um, and many eventually, uh, probably all of them, begin to hallucinate. They see things that aren't there, they converse with animals, they jump off their bikes deep into the night to do battle with invisible beasts that turn out to be mailboxes. They go stark raving mad. So these racers might seem like a different breed. They might seem like animals or brutes or cyborgs, but let, I'm here to tell you that is just not the case. They feel every ache and pain just like you or I would. Let me just say that again. They feel everything. They're not immune to this pain. They aren't masochists and they don't want to suffer either. I'd like you to take a look at the back of your flyers. Take a look at some of these people. Look at them. <coughs> Read their stories. These are real people with real jobs, real families, real concerns. I'd like to introduce you to a few of them who are featured uh, in, in the story of this race. There's Marco Bailo. He's a Slovenian. Wonderful guy. He, his race moniker is Tweety Bird, but he's actually a raptor. But, you know, hopefully nobody will notice. He holds the Guinness Book of World Records for covering the greatest distance on a bicycle in 24 hours. Anyone want to guess? Well over 500 miles. He's a loving family man. He actually, in the 2009 race, he brought his wife and two of his three children with him, and he took as much care of them during the race as they took of him. Take a look at Jim Reese. Jim became a very good friend. I stayed with them north of London. He's a Briton. He was back for his third time in 2009. Jim is prob definitely the most sophisticated and erudite man in the field. He is an executive coach um, and a motivational speaker. He's an author. He experienced horrific abuse in his childhood, and he was racing in 2009 to raise money for his charity about empowering children to believe in themselves. Franz Priest, he's a bad boy, he's got tattoos up his arms and legs, he's got a knack for self-promotion, he's a, he's a tough Austrian. But the night before he was about to leave um, for Oceanside, he lay in his wife's arms in Vienna and asked her did he really have to go, couldn't he just stay in bed with her? <laughs> Michelle Santilhano, another good friend, lives up in the Bay Area, but she's a South African. I call her an uber athlete in the book. She raced, uh, she finished six ultra marathons, 135 miles. She swam the English Channel. She did a quintuple Ironman. She trekked to the True North Pole. And she did a seven, the Seven Summits. But she was petrified at the starting line of this race. And, you'll, and as you read her story, you'll understand why. So these are real people. And they really want to be understood as fully realized humans. So now we come to the part where I explain what possessed me to get involved in an implausible project like this. There are actually three motivations that I'd like to share tonight. The first is that I retired relatively young, and I could. I fancied writing a book after I retired, and 
ideas would pop in and out of my head, and this idea popped into my head one day because I, I, I did befriend someone who did this race, um, and you're supposed to write about something you know. So I thought, why not? The second reason was because I was told I could not. <laughs> you can't tell me you can't do something, Amy. When I first started pitching this uh, book concept, uh, I, I approached a very well-known New York literary agent who will remain unnamed, explained the book concept to him, and he said, if it's not written, if it's a book about a bike race, and it's not written by Lance Armstrong, it doesn't stand a chance. Well, I'm like a bull to a red rag, and that's all I needed to hear. I was off to the races. Is David Fugate here, David? Oh, okay. Well, my agent, David Fugate, is a, is a local agent who took a bet on this project. And uh, all I can say to that New York agent is, <clears throat> neener, neener, neener. <laughs> but the, the, probably the most interesting reason, uh, the, the, the most interesting motivation for me to write this book had to do with what I learned about myself as an endurance athlete. As a girl, I grew up to deny and fear my own vulnerability. Through endurance sports into adulthood, I developed the courage to be imperfect and the courage to fail. I didn't know it at the time, but this book project actually began six years ago, not two years ago. I started kind of focusing on this as a, as a real commercial project two years ago, but six years ago, on a luridly hot and humid day in Madison, Wisconsin, Pat, you remember that day, don't you? That was the day I finished my first Ironman. Does anyone know what an Ironman is? Yeah? So it's a, it's a pretty tough day. You know, it's not RAM. It's a two and a half mile swim and a 112 mile bike ride and a marathon. It takes up. Hey, listen, you know, we're changing, we're recalibrating ourselves here, aren't we? Um, it takes about half a day to, a, to three quarters of a day of hard racing to finish. It's still a, a pretty big deal. So here's how I got to the starting line of Ironman Wisconsin. Two years before this race, I had the chance to retire after two decades in, in business, and I jumped at it. I needed to find the space to open up and become a whole person. Um, and I need to tell you a little growing up story for you to understand that. Um, I grew up in New York City, m me and my two brothers. and. Um, our parents gave us everything. They sacrificed everything for us. We went to the best private schools. We went to the beach every summer. But I don't remember hearing very many I love yous. And I don't ever recall, as my mother's only daughter, having a heart to heart with her about my feelings or fears or anxieties. So I became a goal-oriented girl. And I used my achievements to try to gain affection from my mother. For me, failure wasn't an option because I was never given the emotional equipment to know how to deal with failure. My family didn't operate comfortably at the level of feelings. So fast forward into adulthood and I become this hard charging executive and I get my MBA and I have a big career and it's no surprise that I barreled through my work days trying so hard to be who I thought I should be that I never really figured out who I was. So that's why I jumped at the opportunity to retire in my in my early 40s, and two years afterward, I found myself at this at at at, at uh, Ironman Wisconsin at the starting line. I had expected to finish in the top quartile. I had made it to nationals that year, and you know, failure just wasn't part of my DNA. <sighs> I had a really tough day that day. Mother Nature and inexperience walloped me. The weather was horrific, it was 100 degrees, 100% and humidity, 30 mile an hour headwinds. A third of the race, a third of the field dropped out that day. It was the highest dropout rate of any Ironman ever. And as the race progressed, I grew woozy and sluggish and I fell off my goal pace and somehow I made it to the marathon and I grew increasingly dazed and confused and eventually scared. And a day that had begun with such promise, 14 hours later, I staggered over the finish line and directly to the medical tent. And there I was diagnosed with severe hyponatremia. Hyponatremia is water poisoning. I made the dumb rookie mistake of drinking too much in an effort to keep cool. I gained nine pounds of water weight during that race, 
I, Pat, I looked like the Michelin Man, according to Pat. My brain was swollen, I risked seizure and coma, and even death. So that difficult day turned out to be one of the most important days of my life. At the risk of sounding mawkish, but I'm here among friends tonight, that frightful first Iron Man at the age of 45 put me on a path to find my authentic self. It was the first big failure in my life to achieve a big goal that I'd set for myself. At the age of 45, a little late, I learned that many things are out of control, out of my control, and that failure is part of life. And it happens to everybody. And it finally came around to me. I learned to forgive myself through endurance sports. I learned to appreciate that being vulnerable also makes me beautiful. It's no longer excruciating for me. It's actually liberating. And I learned all of that by pushing myself in endurance sports. So I thought the Ironman was a big deal. But as I settled into life as an endurance athlete and a marathon cyclist, before long, I discovered things called ultra distance races. <laughs> Races that don't last half a day or th even three quarters of a day. Events like the 135 mile long Badwater Ultramarathon takes place in July in Death Valley <laughs> when the asphalt is hot enough to melt the soles of running shoes. I learned about the 3,000 mile long race across America that of course we're talking about tonight. And I recalibrated my own views of the limits of human endurance and the human spirit. But after my bout with hyponatremia, I knew I could not fathom racing these longer distances. Just to be 100% clear, I could never do the race across America, ever. But this is what I had to find out. What type of person puts themselves through this sort of agony and why? Simple question. Since I found that pushing myself in endurance sports was self-revelatory, I figured that understanding the story of how these athletes endure the crucible of these much longer races might offer lessons on an even larger scale. That was the bet I took when I climbed into this minivan with a complete stranger, which I'll get to in a minute, and decided to follow this race in 2009. So, I had a friend, George Vargas, he raced two-man ram, where you're allowed to do it in a team, in 2008. And I had a hunch that exploring this specific event might provide the answers I sought. So, in the spring of 2009, I decided to follow the 28th edition of the Race Across America. Um, I met with a handful of participants before, many of which, uh, actually most of whom are not American citizens. Uh, the race has become fundamentally a European race as it's fallen into obscurity here in the U.S. It was actually, in the early 80s, it was um, much more well known here in the U.S. It was on, eight, I'm dating myself, ABC Wide World of Sports, anyone? <laughs> for four years in a row, and they actually won four Emmys, four years in a row, for putting together uh, the story of this race. It was a gripping and very emotional account. But anyway, it's fallen into obscurity in the U.S. It's mostly a European race now. Um, so I met with a handful of participants beforehand, and um, here's how I covered the race. I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. Step number one, procure a minivan and an air mattress. This is a girl that doesn't really understand camping. Boy, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Step number two, find a driving partner, someone willing to jump in the minivan with you and drive at 15 miles an hour across the country on back rows for no remuneration. I actually did find somebody to do this with me. His name is Les Handy. He's a staff sergeant in the Air Force out of uh, Colorado. I didn't know him, and we met the morning we were supposed to jump in this minivan together. Luckily, he turned out to be one of the most delightful young men you will ever meet. Boy, was I lucky. And step number three, of course, was to drive on back roads, 3,000 miles, day and night, following this race. The racers, within the first few days, they were spread out over 500 miles. I mean, this is madness. And they're going 24-7, and I'm keeping track of different racers all up and down the field, not just the 
folks in the front, but the folks in the back. Les and I had a great time. We actually did. It was bizarre. <laughs> but so then I get home, and the well, actually, let me tell you a little bit about what it felt like to, to try to track this race for two weeks. And nobody had ever tried this before. Nobody has written a, ra a book about an ultra-distance race that covers so many racers that lasts so many days in history. I don't think I've ever found anyone who's done that. There are some memoir memoirs out there. They're all pretty bad. Um, so I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, but I did limp back home, minus one appendix, but that's a whole other <laughs> story. Okay, so it's July now, and I'm home, and I'm supposed to write this book. I just traveled around the world. I just followed this race. I have turned myself inside out, so now I have to write a book, right? The second challenge I experienced was conveying the experience of this race. It is really very difficult to get your head wrapped around what these athletes go through. They are brutalized and turned into simpler beings. Here's the story of Yuri Robich. Yuri Robich um, was the defending champion in 2009. He won more Race Across America races than any other man. And in the 2005 race, he's done so many, the 2005 race, he was killing the field. He was so far ahead of the next closest guy, he was going to win. It's day seven. Yuri Robich has had seven hours of sleep in seven days. He's approaching the finish line, and he stops his bike in the middle of the night and throws it into the bushes. He's, he's screaming and bellowing. He says, I quit. And his crew worked with him, pleaded with him, tried to find out what was going on, and he said he couldn't remember what his son's face looked like. So that's what this race does to people, and that's what I try to convey in my book, which actually leads me to the third challenge related to this project, which is my initial bias about who these racers are as people. They're not, as it turns out, single-minded, freaky, masochistic, nihilistic weirdos. They're just not. So I'm going to close with an excerpt that gets to the questions that are really at the deepest layer of this book's narrative, which are these. Why do we willingly seek out punishing physical or mental challenges? What motivates us to persevere? Raise your hand if you've ever tested your limits physically or mentally to the point where you've wanted to scream, I just can't take it for another minute. Good number of you. So why do we push ourselves, boys and girls? What are we trying to learn? Is it because we need to learn to fail, as in my case? Is it because we need to find our courage? Is it because we're simply curious about what happens to our bodies when we push it to the limit? We all have different motivations and maybe even compulsions for doing this. But I guarantee you this. I guarantee that you're out there to prove something to somebody. You're trying to gain approval from somebody in the end. For defending champion Yuri Robit, he was out there to prove his worthiness, even though he had won this race more than anyone else. You see, he was raised by a single mom. His father abandoned him when he was young. His brother was a, down, a champion downhill skier and got all the limelight. And Yuri Robich was racing his heart out with the aggression of a wounded child. So, like Yuri's story, Hell on Two Wheels sets the race in the context of each of these racers' personal journeys and helps us gain an understanding of what motivates each of them and each of their stories is very, very different. That was another thing that I had to learn as I got into this. I'd expected a, a, a certain type of person. I'd expected um, you know, people to fit into a, into a mold and they, they, they surprised me. They did not. So, that well-known New York agent just didn't get it. Hell on Two Wheels isn't just a book about a bike race. <laughs> the 2009 race happened and I was very lucky. It happened to be the closest and most controversial race in the history of the Race Across America. That certainly didn't hurt the story. But the story that lies at the deepest layer of this book's narrative is all about the why. So I'm going to read a, a quick passage and then we'll open it up uh, to some questions. How does that sound? Okay, so here we go. 
So how does a racer maintain the will to go on? Sitting on a narrow bicycle saddle and churning his legs for up to 12 days straight, especially toward the end when physical discomfort blots out everything else and his sleep-deprived mind falters and sputters? Actually, not a single racer maintains his resolve. Each comes close to quitting more than once. Racers sob and scream and curl up in fetal positions along the road, but then pull themselves together again and get back on their bikes. In their bleakest moments on the road, each racer finds his own reason to keep going. Racers explain that Ram demands so much it peels everything away and lays them bare, reconnecting them to their simpler animal selves. In this state of grace, athletes explain that they feel intensely alive and in touch with nature. Some claim to experience powerfully spiritual moments of transcendence. All of this suggests that for ultra-distance racers, the balance between pain and pleasure might not be as out of kilter as it first seems. When Kirk Johnson ran the Badwater Ultra Marathon, he was filled with eye-opening wonder while watching meteor showers in the night sky of the desert when the simple act of moving through was a source of joy. Johnson was a self-described seeker who thought, quote, there might be a way through the unfathomable post-apocalyptic wilderness of racing in Death Valley to reach the veil and touch something beyond me and my life, a place where misery and transcendence were so deeply intertwined it couldn't be without meaning. So now I'm going to open it up. Tell you how they pee if you ask me nicely. <laughs> what do they pee? <laughs> when did this race start, and what was the the, the the genesis of the whole insane thing? Yeah, so I, it started in 1982. So it's been going on. This will be the 30th year, if my math is correct. And the genesis was really actually coming up with a way of certifying finish times. I mean, people were getting faster and faster at racing their bikes over long distances, partially a result of technology, partially a result of training, but it was coming up with a way to authenticate that somebody actually pedaled 3,000 miles. The Guinness Book of World Records got into the game, and then eventually a cyclist decided to come up with a set of race rules and uh, a way of enforcing them such that people who were very serious about this could feel as though the competition was fair. Yes? How many did more people finish or quit, and why did they quit? Yeah, so about half the field every year uh, drops out um, for all sorts of reasons. And uh, there are some uh, there's some interesting stories. You know, so it's, it's neck failure. It's all sorts of physical reasons. It's a lot of mental reasons. Um, actually, the... The mental game is the toughest game to play in this race, but about half the folks that start finish. Any uh, whisperings about performance enhancement? Not really. No, absolutely not. There, there, there's sporadic drug testing, but there's never. There've been a lot of controversies in this race, but actually none of them have revolved around performance enhancing drugs. Everybody's on caffeine. Everybody's on <laughs> guarana. Guarana. Everybody's on herbs and. But um, there's no money in this, and uh, so far it hasn't been tainted by that. Yes. So how did you talk to them if they were racing 24/7 and well, 23/7 and sleeping one? Great question. Sometimes you you pull up to them and you get what's called the shrug and grunt. Just I don't have energy for you. I can't even look at you. Um, other times racers would be perky and interested in talking. Um, they would be uh, stopped every so often, you know, to take a rest, and you could wander up to them then. Um, the crews were very helpful. I had every crew, uh, crew chief's cell phone number, and if I didn't see a racer on the road in a given day, I would make sure to uh, check in with their crew chief and find out what happened. Um, cell coverage was sometimes a little spotty, so that didn't ever, I didn't get to every racer every day. Uh, and you can even use their websites because uh, they'll be blogging in real time, almost, literally from their bike. As you know, they have radio communication back and forth to their follow vehicle. They're always followed on the road by one of their vehicles to keep them safe from traffic, and they can talk back and forth. So sometimes they'd be 
blogging and it would be going up into cyberspace directly from the road so you could keep in touch that way. Lots of different ways. Question in the back. Yes. What is the prize for this race? Is it monetary? Is it just uh, acknowledgement? This is the purest form of amateur sport, <laughs> which is a kind way of saying you get a medal and an attaboy or an atta girl. That's it. That's it. Yes. Um, did you ride the same bicycle the whole time, barring equipment failure? Ah, uh, we have a cyclist in our midst. No, no they time. typically bring many bikes. They they bring a climbing bike. They bring a time trial bike and they'll try to bring a spare bike to harvest parts from as the race progresses. Yes, Brian? How many of the, the cyclists ride slow and how many of them, like what's the percentage of solo versus two people riding slow? Yeah, yeah. Riders? So this race, as it's uh, matured, it, it, there are now, in addition to the solo racers, which is what my book was about, you can race two man, two person, two man, two woman, uh, four person, teams and eight-person teams, and, and they're fundamentally different experiences. If you can imagine an eight-person team, you're basically doing 15-minute polls, and you have four people on and four people off at any one time, so it's a, just a very different race. Um, and there are several hundred team racers that start in Oceanside the Saturday following the soloists. So the women will start the Tuesday, the men will start the Wednesday, and the teams will start the Saturday, and they all finish at about the same time. Question over here. Amy, hey, uh, yeah. Ken, what are some of the secrets that they have for their outfits as far as saddle sores? Uh, I mean, how do they start it out? What, how do they prep themselves yeah. outfit wise? Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. You're, getting, yeah. you're getting to those questions, aren't you? <laughs> the below the waist questions. Um, well, actually, there's uh, they use a lot of different. Um, types of clothing and gear for keeping cool. The first few days, it's called the death zone. The first few days through the desert, it's 125 degrees, basically, for two or three days in a row. And um, so they, they use different types of cooling vests and evaporative cooling lotion that they, they, they look like mummies. They dress themselves in white, and then they use this evaporative cooling liquid. Down there, lots of different things, none of which work. <laughs> Here. Have you heard from any of the racers that are featured in the book, and what are they, what's their response? Yeah, um, very favorable. Um, there are some controversies in the book. I don't want to give it away, but there are some kind of ugly things that happen, and it's a little painful for some of them. People don't turn up well necessarily during this race for all sorts of reasons, including the sleep deprivation. But in general, people have been um, extremely appreciative that I've been able to sketch them as people, which is what they really want to be seen as. That's um, Amy, how long does it take for a racer to, you know, you, said, you mentioned that several racers do this every year. I, I can't believe that a year would be enough time to recover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the racers, actually Janet Christensen, who was supposed to be here tonight, she couldn't, she's become a good friend. Some of you have met her. She lives up in Poway, she's featured in the book. She bruised her tailbone very badly in 2008, and it was still deeply bruised when she started the race in 2009. So this is not a, a healthy thing, which is why I used the word compulsion before. I mean, this can be very brutalizing, but there, there was once a racer who did 19 of these. Um, Yuri Robich, who is also a star featured in, in my book, uh, he did seven. So, and yes, you're going to ask why, and I'm just going to say read the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good response. I know some of these uh, physical injuries that you talk about are quite um, long lasting. But some of the psychological injuries, are there folks that have been so screwed up by this experience <laughs> that, that it really stays with them and messes them up? Uh, there have been some racers who have scared their crew members and their families so much that <coughs> marriages have ended. I mean, having a family member walk... You, you have to become an animal. When racers toward the end, when they stop their bike for a break, they get cradled, I'm just, they get cradled in their crew's arms, they, they get taken to a massage table, stripped of their clothing, washed like a little baby, 
fed, spoon fed, and put back on their bike. They become an infant, and this is very difficult to watch. So that's caused some issues. And then some racers become very volatile, but, and it's because of the sleep deprivation, and so they can be extremely uh, difficult on their crew members. Crews have actually mutinied on racers and left them by the side of the road. <laughs> you know, goodbye, that was the last time you say that to me. So that's happened as well. The interpersonal team dynamics are very interesting and a big part of the book as well. But, yeah, Cliff. Uh, just so you know, I have zero plans. <laughs> <laughs> but how do some of these different ultra athletes train for something like this? How do you prepare? You don't. You, there's no way to simulate this race. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, I mean, some racers actually don't even do a single 24-hour ride. Um, but most will try to get a several hundred mile ride in and just they ride. These folks love being on their bikes. They are on their, so Marco Bello, you know, he's a loving dad. He puts his, he comes home from work. He's a civil servant in, you know, the Slovenian agricultural ministry. So he comes home from a day at work. He spends a few hours with his kids. Then he gets on his bike at, I don't know, nine at night. And he comes back at four in the morning. And he sleeps for two hours and goes to work. I mean, that's what these guys do. But no, it's impossible. It's actually impossible to train for these things. Yeah. Yes, back here. Yep, you. Yep. Um, you know, we all, we've all heard about how Lance Armstrong ran in the New York City Marathon and was sort of doing the okay time. Is there anybody like that who is maybe an ultra athlete from a sport but not a cyclist who actually tried this as a test of themselves? That yes. Is, what was the result of uh, there's one, uh, um, actually, in, in my book, Franz Priest, the Austrian, the tattooed he-man. He um, uh, he was actually an, a ma marathoner. He did uh, 50 marathons, and that was his, or 50 ultra marathons. You know, in, in Austria, I don't know what the distance is, but I don't know, 40, 50 mile races. And he decided to pick up a bike one day, and within two or three years, he was in the race across America. He came in fourth one year. So it's, it's, you know, some have crossed over from other ultra. Michelle Santillano, you know, she swam the channel. She did six ultra marathons. She was a trekker, a mountaineer, an adventurer, and turned herself into an ultra cyclist. It's when ABC covered this, and I highly recommend that for anybody. I don't know how you could get a hold of it, but they were so good. They're on there the was, YouTube. You can oh, they, find okay. them on there. There was one rider. Uh, his name escapes me. I believe he was hit and paralyzed for life. But he rode unsupported. This guy rode with the water bottles, credit card, Taco Bells, and whatever. Is there anybody that does that? It's that impossible. It's not possible. And it's extremely dangerous. When you get to uh, West Virginia, I'm going to West Virginia. <laughs> You get these logging trucks. You get these small little roads, you know, through through the mountains there, curves, and you get these logging trucks who really resent cyclists. So just think about that for a minute. You need that follow vehicle behind you. Other questions? Yes. Who's the youngest person to participate? The oldest person. So there was a 19-year-old. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it takes to be a 19-year-old doing this, and there was a and he finished. There was a 64-year-old, and believe it or not, the year that I followed the race, they're not in the book because my bit, my book was about the solo riders, but there was one four-man team, and all four of them were over 70, two were over 80. <laughs> Now think about this, they cycle all day, all night. Now, okay, you, you, you split it up, so you only ride 100 miles a day as an 80 some odd year old. And your, you know, your, your turn could happen at three in the morning in the middle of a you know, mountain climber. So yeah, that's, that's what happens out. There was a guy who did it who was uh, challenged, physically challenged. He had uh, one leg. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, please. How they pee? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so um, the men sometimes will do it on the bike. You know, a lot of the time, actually, they'll do it on the bike. The women, there was one woman, one year, and it's in the book, so I won't give it too much of it away. But it wasn't the year that I followed. But she was set to win the race. 
she, women regular, actually years ago, they don't so much anymore, but in the past they would come in in the top five. There would always be a woman in the top five. Anyway, this woman was so good, she was going to win the race. They were, they, she had a $25,000 incentive prize to beat all the men, and there was very good money on the fact that she would do it. Turns out she didn't, and one of the reasons why, she said, is because she had to take four minutes off every time she had to pee. Think about that. That adds up, because you're drinking a lot. Um, anyway, good question. Ah, how did I do? <laughs> Great. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you.